Thank you so much, Mara. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be with you all today. And I, uh, I want us to just take a moment to check in. You know, last week, um, when we finally got to Leviticus, I know that some of us were like, oh, really? Well, at least there's Purim. So if anyone's like me, they were like, oh, Exodus is so fun, so much like interesting clothing and building and gold. And then we're like, really? Now we have to be in Leviticus and just like lists of like slaughtering animals. Like that doesn't sound that fun. But but then we had Purim, so that kind of made up for it. Now Purim's over and now we're just in it. We're just in the temple sacrifice time. So um, if you're not excited about it, that's okay. We're here anyway, and we're going to try to find some ways that we're going to connect in with it, because we are. So, because <laughs> this is where we are, we're in Leviticus. Um, I, uh, I'm thrilled to be looking at what I think might be the most relevant part of this Parsha, which is the prohibition on consuming blood. And whenever there's something that is in the Torah that's thousands of years old, that many people still observe this practice, I think it's worth looking at, first of all, the origin of this, but also how it impacts our lives and also what are some of the meanings behind it. So I want to just warn you in advance, we only have 45 minutes together. This is going to be like a teeny, teeny taste of this concept. I want to name that anyone who's typing in the chat, that is so great. Keep typing in the chat. We have some vegetarians here who, who have not eaten blood in many years. We have people who keep kosher. And if you keep kosher, um, you probably aren't eating blood, at least of certain animals. And um, though what we're going to see is uh, there's different prohibitions on blood eating of different animals. And uh, we have some kosher vegans, amazing. And I'll just remind us, especially if this is your first time in one of these Zooms, we love the chat. We love using the chat. We love comments. We love questions. I will do my best to keep up with the chat. Um, if you ask a question um, and I don't respond to it, I'll try to get to it at the end where you can ask it again. Also, if you are the kind of person that's like, I want to hear from the teacher and I don't want to read 100 messages in the chat, that is totally fine. I promise you will have a full enriching class and you do not need to follow the chat. So just if that's coming up for you and like the text is too much, totally fine. Stay with me. We're going to look at some text together and don't worry about the chat. But also, please write in the chat. I'd love to hear your questions and comments. Um, I will read them and uh, Mara will let me know, especially if there's an important question that I miss. All right, here we go. We're going into Parshat Sav the second Parsha in the book of Leviticus. And I am sharing my screen over here. Parshat Sav. So this is the main um, pasuk. This is the main passage that we're going to be looking at. And it is uh, Leviticus 7, verses 26 and 27. Kol dam lo tochlu bechol you should you must not consume and again this the hebrew word is whole um eat um you must not consume any blood either of bird or animal in any one of your settlements anyone who eats blood shall be cut off from kin and that hebrew is kol nefesh asher tochal kol dam venichrata hanefesh hahi me meha. So, like a lot of times in the Torah, we have the prohibition followed by the consequence if you do not follow this prohibition. And a lot of Leviticus is about things that you do or don't do in the temple and that the priests should do and not do and the difference between what the priests should, should and shouldn't do and what the non-priests should and shouldn't do. And I want to highlight this passage because this passage is not just about the priests and it's not just about the temple. So when we see this phrase, Mosh Votechem, any of your settlements, that is a clue that this is talking about not just in the temple and the temple sacrifice, but it's talking about all the places that you might live. And we'll see that um, the rabbis of the Talmud extend this to not just 
all over the land of Israel, but all over the world. So we're receiving a commandment here that is in the middle of a long list of things that you do and don't do in the temple, but actually it applies in all places and in all times. And unlike a lot of the pieces of this Parsha, where we're like, okay, I guess we have to read this, but like, it's not super relevant since we don't have a temple. This is something that people still observe. Jews in 2024 are still keeping this commandment and many Muslims as well are keeping this commandment in 2024. Do not eat a bl blood of a bird or an animal. Let's do a little mini um, mini Hebrew lesson over here. We have in the Hebrew la'of, which refers to bird, and we can assume that this passage is referring to kosher birds, so not birds of prey. Probably it just means the, the birds that we're allowed to eat, probably mostly domesticated birds. They didn't have chicken. We often translate of as chicken, um, but they didn't have chicken yet in those days, but maybe they had doves um, and similar and pigeons. And then ve la behema. Behema is the word that refers to a domesticated animal. So a goat, a sheep, a cow, etc. And this is what this is talking about. And um, going to verse 27, anyone who eats blood shall be cut off from kin. We're not going to spend too much time on this piece in terms of what the consequences of eating blood are. They're very serious. Um, this word nihrata is from the same word as karate to be cut off from the, from the community. Um, it's a very severe punishment. Um, I am not here to tell you that this is your punishment in 2024, but just to say from the perspective of the, the Torah and the ancients that it was very, very serious, um, very serious. It's not punishable by death, but it's punishable by essentially excommunication. And we could, we could, we could, we guess, or we could wonder why this is, why should, why is eating blood such a serious offense that you would be excommunicated? That's not going to be the focus of our session today, um, but I'm always open to hearing uh, comments in the chat. Um, uh, we have a, a, a comment about, um, what about pheasants, not strictly domesticated, but they are eaten by a lot of people? So again, there's there's a couple different ways to answer that question. Are we talking about we time travel to the time of the Torah and someone is able to capture a pheasant and and slaughter it in a kosher way? Um, I would say it's probably fine. Um, what gets really complicated, and we're not talking explicitly about shrita, though we will talk a little bit about shrita or kosher kosher slaughter today, is to trap an animal, uh, a wild animal, and for that animal to not have any uh, any cuts or bruises or any injuries in the trapping process is very difficult. And when you when you shecht an animal, when you do kosher slaughter an animal, the animal has to ain behem moom. There can't be a moom. There can't be a any sort of um, hurt uh, boo boo on the <laughs> on the animal. And so it's very complicated to imagine trapping a wild animal, and then also being able to do a full kosher slaughter on the animal. Again, it really depends on the time period in history, um, how strict that piece is. Okay. Um, but yeah, it would be fun to kind of list out some of the animals and imagine. Um, so, um, so we're having, um, we're having some, um, someone, someone's just asking, what is this? A, a, Ain um, parsha besifre teman. Um, this has to do with how um, how the parsha is um, how the parsha is laid out in in different communities. It doesn't have to do with the context um, of the text. So I think it's something to do with sifre teman of a, of a different like way the verses where the parsha starts. Um, so let's see what Rashi says. Um, some of this I already um, already covered. Um, so this is on this phrase, Bechol um, you shall not have blood in all your habitations. Um, and Rashi's commenting, and again, keep in mind, Rashi is a French commentator around the 12th century. 
Rashi is directly or indirectly always referencing the Talmud and later Midrash Halakha and Midrash Agada, both Midrash Halakha laws that this become that are based on this passage and Midrash Agada, different um, ways of understanding it that are creative and you know helpful and interesting. So he says, since this is a personal duty, chova haguf, meaning it's on the person's body. It's on the, it's a, there's different things where the, the law is versus how you treat the land versus how the person treats the, the self. Or we could also have laws that are between a person and God. Since it's a personal duty, chovat haguf, the ena chovat karka, so it's a, it's a chova, it's a requirement on the body, meaning what you eat, and not a chova on the karka, on the land, um, which would be something like the laws of the sabbatical years, for example, would be a chova on the land, um, or some of the some of the laws in this part have to do with the temple. Since this is a personal duty on on the chova haguf, um, and not a duty depending on um, Palestinian soil, just referring to the land of Israel, it applies wherever Israelites are settled. In Kedushin, if we were to go to the Talmud, it is explained why is it necessary to use this term, Bechol Moshvotechem. And again, we see this in other places where the rabbis are commenting on the Torah and they're trying to figure out, is this the law that only applies in the temple? Is this the law that only applies in Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel? Or is this the law for all time, for everyone, everywhere? And this is the latter. What else does Rashi say? Le'of ulebehemah. Prat ladam dagim ve chagavim. Excluded from this prohibition is the blood of fish and locusts. Some of us are pulling out our old recipe cards for making our gefilte fish. What about gefilte fish? Fish have blood. If we can't eat blood, uh, how can we eat fish? So Rashi is very, very careful to say there are some kosher animals, fish and locusts. Anyone here ever eaten a locust? Super curious. There's been some events in the past 10 to 20 years where you could try a kosher locust. Chocolate covered, very crunchy, soon to be available in, in, a, in a locust flower. It's going to be very popular. I saw, some, I saw uh, Stephen Colbert eat some on, on TV uh, a couple of years ago. All right. Um, fish and locusts are excluded from this prohibition. So again, this is a very good example of when the Torah decides to be specific, um, that we can assume that it, because it's being specific, mentioning uh, birds and domesticated animals, we can assume that if it meant also fish and locusts were prohibited, would have listed them. So we can calculate, oh, so fish and locusts, we can eat their blood. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, again, because it's in the section of animal sacrifices, there's something about the blood that has to do with the blood, as people were writing in the comments, life force. But there's also something that do with the blood that has to do with animal sacrifice and how blood was used or discarded or burnt or not eaten in the temple. That um, when we get to this category of fish and locusts, they're just in a different category and we can eat their blood. I'm going to take a, a quick pause um, before we um, go to Leviticus. We're going to we're going to peek at Leviticus 17, and we're going to see some. Uh, we're going to peek at Leviticus 17 so we can see a little bit more about how this plays out in terms of what happens when the animal is being slaughtered. Thank you so much for everyone writing in the chat. I'm just going to take a really quick peek. Um, um, at it. Someone says locust, locust blood, yum. Um, <clears throat> um, someone else says no. Um, and there's some, there's some speculations about Mashiach. Um, Noah says even chocolate covered locusts. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's something that's really amazing. Those who, of you who are environmentalists here, and even those of you who are who are vegans or vegetarians, there's something really amazing when we start talking about eating insects, which even if in our, our Western diets would never include that, uh, 
insects are able to eat so many things that humans are not interested in eating. And if you can grind them up into a flour, it basically takes very similar to like an oatmeal or something like that. And you can get so much protein from these insects. Environmentally, it's very, very efficient. And there's significantly less suffering than the way that animals are treated in factory farms. And if, if I were a prophet, um, or if it was my job to predict the world, the future American diet, I would say in the next 10 to 20 years, we'll be eating a lot of insect flour, probably not chocolate covered locusts, but probably um, insect flour, including kosher and even kosher for Passover, right? Grasshoppers, right? We isn't like, it's, it sounds great. More protein go around. Um, Andrew added, I looked it up. Locusts don't even have blood. They have something analogous to blood. Great. So that's, that could be another reason why, you know, we don't know if Rashi knew that, right? But he wanted us to know that it was okay to eat the whole animal, uh, whether or not they actually um, have blood. Betsy wants us to know that insects are low fat. A lot of people saying no thanks. Um, Carlos reminding us we probably already eat insects. We're not aware of it. Absolutely, right? It's, if, any processed food that we're eating, there is a, a legal limit. It's still less than 1%, but there's a legal limit of the amount of insects that can be in any processed food. And they're probably, you know, they're probably there. Um, Andrea says, isn't just one species of are kosher? Yes, there are certain things that you need to know about the insect to make them, um, to make them uh, kosher. Um, and there's some questions about um, what does it mean to not eat the blood of the animal? And we're going to look at that um, in a minute when we're looking at uh, kashrut. So um, I don't know how many folks here have ever slaughtered an animal or observed an animal being slaughtered. It, it often is directly related to the fact if you grew up on a farm, you are from a community that slaughters animals. I live in Brooklyn where you can, there's still live animal uh, stores. They're mostly halal. They're mostly in Muslim neighborhoods where you can literally go and you can buy a live chicken and someone right there will slaughter it for you. Um, that is not a practice that I currently have, but it's something that you could do if you if you lived in a city that has that or if you lived in a, in a country or part of the country that like having it on a farm. Um, but I have witnessed a chicken slaughter before uh, from a kosher butcher and there's um, there's a number of steps that are taken in the slaughter process that enable the animal's blood to, uh, to, to remove as much of the blood as possible. Um, I, I want to just let folks know we have, 25, we have uh, 25 minutes left and we are going to be talking about slaughtering animals and the, some of the gore that is related to the blood coming out of the animal. We're going to be talking about knives. And so just if folks are like, want to, you know, put down their coffee so that they don't get nauseous, or if, if you just would rather not talk about blood, I'm just warning everyone, we're going to be talking about, it's going to get more gory than it has uh, between now and the end of the session. Um, Harry says, last year I saw my first kosher kill. I'm so curious what animal. Um, a lot more comments um, here. Emily raises and slaughtered chickens. Some people are uh, saying, yeah, that's why I became vegetarian. So I don't want to talk about blood and gore. Totally acceptable. And um, thank you for, look, we just had five people leave. Good, you're taking care of yourself. All right, let's continue with our text. Uh, here we are, and we're going we're gonna to look at Leviticus 17. So we are, we are moving over to another Parsha. Uh, so so that we can get some more information about the kosher slaughter process and what happens. So here's what Leviticus 17 says. Um, if any Israelite or stranger who resides among them hunts down an animal or a bird that may be eaten, that person shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. And so before we get to the next um, verse, so what does it mean to pour out the blood? Essentially, what you're doing is you're taking the animal and you are hanging it in some way so that the blood drips out from the animal. So whereas if I didn't keep kosher and I'm slaughtering an animal, 
Um, I might have a way of butchering it. Um, a lot of us um, may have seen like an animal where you use your hands to break its neck or you, as soon as you slaughter it in some way, you um, start butchering it. So if it's a kosher animal, one of the steps after you do the um, the, the chad bechalak, the straight and smooth cut on the neck, you only have one chance, one cut, when you're doing a kosher cut, you are going to basically hang the animal upside down by their feet. And when they say pour out, that's essentially the most common strategy. Um, and the idea is, and I know a lot of people are commenting, well, it's impossible to get all the blood out. There's a number of steps. This is just one of the steps. And probably if we're talking, you know, scientifically on a cellular level, um, probably not 100% of the blood is getting out. But this is one of the one of the steps. And that that you know leads me to think, well, even if I'm keeping kosher and I'm eating these animals. Am I eating the blood? That's that's a question. Um, if any Israelite, um, okay, we're going to verse 14. For the life of all flesh, its blood is its life. Therefore, I say to the Israelite people, you shall not partake of the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Anyone who partakes it of it shall be cut off. And I'm bringing this, even though it's not in our Parsha, because it gives a little bit more explanation. In our Parsha, it's just like, by the way, don't eat blood, you'll be cut off. And then this, and again, for Leviticus, this is very, I think this is very, you know, poetic and I'm grateful for the elaboration. And some people have already been writing about this in the, in the chat that what is the reason that we don't eat blood? Uh, again, very easy answer. One of the reasons is because it's what we do because it's what the Torah says. We, we are aware of other tribes, you know, people who worship idols, et cetera, who eat blood, drink blood, et cetera. And we don't do that. And so we're different than them. And we have this practice. Um, and then I really wanted to bring you Leviticus 17 to see for the life of all flesh, its blood is its life. Therefore, um, and th th there's this beautiful line, ki nefesh kol basar damo ve nafshohu. So, and they're, they're, the word nefesh is repeated um, in this verse. Um, for the life of all flesh, its blood is its life. And this is, again, I think it's a beautiful poetic uh, line uh, that is kind of rare for what a lot of Leviticus is, which is just like, these are the rules. I'm giving them to you because they're the rules. The end. Um, all right, we're going to... Um, um, and, I, and I want to just add, this is something I was referencing before when we were talking about, do we capture wild animals and or can we eat a wild animal? And this is one of the source texts. This is also not from our Parsha. This is from Leviticus 22. Nevela utrefa lo yuchal. You shall not eat anything that died or was torn by beasts. Therefore, by coming impure, I am Hashem. So we have this concept that we learn later and that there's thousands of pages written on these two words, nevela and trefa. You, it, and it is also not kosher to eat an animal that died on its own. Like let's say you and I are going for a walk in the woods, we find a deer, we don't know how it died, it's dead, we're like, hey, free meat. It's not kosher to eat that animal that died on its own. By the way, same thing in modern day slaughterhouses, very, very common for certain percentages of animals to die based on those conditions or for all kinds of reasons, that is not kosher to eat that animal. Of course, in North America, we in the United States, we have plenty of laws also about how healthy the animal needs to be, kosher or not, how healthy the animal needs to be before if you can eat that animal, or at least you can slaughter it and sell it. Um, and then we also have the word trefa. Some of you might know that word from Yiddish, treif. Well, it comes from here. And the original meaning of the word trefa is torn. And again, this is the example I was giving before. If we were to capture, uh, if we were to succeed in, let's say, uh, capturing a deer, going, we go hunting, we capture a deer. Well, if that deer has a moom, has a cut, has a tear, um, even if we were to then slaughter it in a kosher way, it's not a kosher animal because it has to be whole, it has to be healthy before we, um, before we slaughter that animal. All right, we are going to um, transition into some Talmud. Um, and before we do that, I'm going to take a peek at the chat. Um, thanks, everyone, for questions um, and your conversation. Again, if the chat's too much, please ignore it. Just, you know, stay with me. Um, 
And if you like it, we can have like five conversations happening at once. And that can be a fun way to connect with um, um, two, two, 200 people. Um, so one of the questions is, does it mean not to eat meat or to cook it thoroughly? Um, and one of the steps that we haven't gotten into, because again, this is not quite a class on kosher slaughter, but if we were doing a whole workshop on kosher slaughter, maybe we should have one, Mara, class idea, um, is, is the other step that helps get the blood out is the salting. So when you buy kosher meat, uh, it's already been salted and that's to get, to get the, um, the blood out and is also sometimes just called koshering. Um, but essentially you're, you're putting salt on it and that helps get the blood out. And that's also why usually, even if you're slaughtering the animal yourself, you wouldn't slaughter it on the same day that you're gonna eat it because you're actually like letting it sit, the meat sit with the salt. Um, I think a, a question I'm seeing a few times in the chat is like, what is the, uh, is there a symbolism in the blood? And uh, a lot of people are connecting blood to the soul. And can you speak of that? Well, first of all, I just, I love, I love this question because I think there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different ways to imagine it. And again, more than 10 people have dropped out of this Zoom. Maybe they had somewhere to be and maybe they're, it makes them uncomfortable, whether they are someone who currently eats meat or doesn't eat meat. Um, and, you know, we have this interesting thing in Hebrew where we have multiple words for the soul, ruach, nefesh, neshama. We have multiple words for soul and they have different um, different connotations depending if we're looking at them in the Torah or in Kabbalistic literature. And, and so you'll notice it just looking at the Safaria page, you know, on the one, you know, it, it has this phrase, um, ki nefesh kol basar damo benaf show, for the life is all flesh, the blood is its life, but it doesn't translate, it translates nefesh, again, which I and a lot of people here, I think have the connotation of nefesh as life, as soul. And there's this idea that perhaps out of respect to the animal, perhaps it's superstitious, um, perhaps it's to separate the Jewish practices from some sort of grotesque thing that other let's say idol worships, worshipers are doing, um, you know, the other, the other example, of course, cooking a kid in its mother's milk, cooking a baby goat in the milk of their mother. We, we have archeological evidence that people literally did that, that that was a common practice to do. And that was something that people wanted to do. Maybe it tasted good. Maybe it was something that, you know, that was a fertility ritual of some sort, but, but there's definitely this idea that um, this is very, very serious, eating the blood, and that the blood is not just, I don't know, gross or, um, you know, just bad or something like that, that, that actually the blood is holy. Because if we read the whole rest of the Parsha, um, so if you, if you weren't grossed out now, time to get even more grossed out. Um, there's a lot happening with blood and burning it and sprinkling it, um, you know, what to do if it gets on your clothes and, you know, purity, um, purity and imper purity. And by the way, we have some really thoughtful um, comments coming through. Um, uh, blood is more than symbolism. If an animal has blood, then without it, it is dead. So blood is literally life giving. Uh, those of us, um, I, I recently was watching an episode of Grey's Anatomy. Anyone? Grey's Anatomy. Um, and, you know, they, they had a situation where like, they were like doing a surgery on someone and they kept giving this person blood transfusions and the organs were all working, but the blood, but they couldn't keep enough blood in the person's body to finish the surgery because of, because of some other problem that was happening. And blood isn't the only thing that makes someone alive, right? We need, we need heart, we need brain. The whole question of when is a person or an animal dead or alive is a very, very significant question here. Um, but in, in this case, um, you know, I think, I think there's more than one answer um, to that question. We have a very uh, important uh, reference to Bram Stoker's Dracula, the blood is the life. Um, and then we have another comment, what we eat or drink has a direct impact on our body and soul. Um, 
And, you know, there's, it's already the case that if you're following Leviticus and you're following Jewish law, that there's a lot of things that you're not doing. So you're not eating an animal that died on its own. You're not eating a whole bunch of animals, right? You're not eating pigs. You're not eating horses. There's a lot of animals that you're not eating. Um, and then we're saying, okay, and there's a process. And again, for some of us, it's very grotesque and we don't want to think about it. We just want our, our, our chicken dinner on a plate. Um, but for some of us thinking about the steps between this animal was alive, this animal was walking around, this animal had thought, this animal had, you know, eight things and, and we want to, we want to, respect the life force. And one way to do that is to, to not eat this, um, to not eat this. Hmm. Um, we're going to keep going Mara, but definitely thank you, um, Mara and everyone. Thank you for that question. And, um, please keep, keep the questions coming. Um, I, I appreciate everyone being really thoughtful. And if you have your own answer to this, to this question, what does blood have to do with the soul? Um, please do add that, um, to the chat. Um, I bet some of you have been wondering, what about eggs? What about eggs? What if the blood is in an egg? And this is a very, very uh, hot topic in the kosher world. If you've ever worked in a kosher kitchen, um, or if you yourself have had your own chickens, um, usually if we're buying eggs from the grocery store, it's pretty rare that there's blood spots in the eggs or that you have to even check your eggs um, for blood spots, but there's a big, big debate on uh, eating an egg that has blood in it um, because isn't that prohibited, right? Carate, right? Excommunication. Uh, and especially if you live on a farm and you have roosters, probably like something like one in four, one in five of your eggs might be, um, might be, might have a blood spot in it. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so here's jumping all the way to the Gemara, um, quoting this verse. The sages taught in a bright of this first stage, you shall consume no manner of blood, right? Kol dam lo toklu. And it says, I would derive from here that even with regard to blood of bipeds, human beings, blood of eggs, blood of grasshoppers, and blood of fish, all these are included in the prohibition. Again, we know from Rashi, because he's read the whole Talmud and probably a bunch of other stuff, that later um, we kind of take out fish um, and we take out some of the insects. But just to say, again, the rabbis, when they first saw this, they were like, so does this really mean all blood? And they were already thinking blood of eggs, that, um, that you, they would see some blood inside of an egg. Um, and, and so that's like the first um, statement. And then they start going through blood of um, other things, blood of spleen, blood of heart, blood of eggs, blood of grasshoppers, blood of um, some seat. Um, I don't think I know what that is. Um, that which is some sort of juice. So blood, maybe you don't know where it's from, the, the blood that came out. Um, that's the blood that oozes from the neck of the animal after your initial spurt of its slaughter. Um, if you if you've slaughtered an animal before, you know what I'm talking about. So again, they're they're getting they they're where some of you are. They're like, can you really get all the blood out? Um, Rabbi Yehuda deems one liable in the case of blood of tzitzit. So this idea, um, just want to make sure I had a good translation for you there. It's just from the same the word of coming out. It's funny because it's very similar to the word notzot, which means feathers, um, but it's the it's the little extra that's squeezed out. Okay. Kind of gross. Let's go to the next section. Okay. <laughs> um, and again, the blood found in eggs is forbidden. Occasionally, it's forbidden to eat the entire egg because of blood spots. Therefore, when using eggs in a food, the eggs must be examined for blood spots. So this is a much later text, Keith Sorts, Shulchan Aruch. But this idea that if you keep kosher, you can't just um, take a whole egg and just eat it. You should be checking it, um, each egg individually in a glass bowl. Again, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm saying this is a custom and a practice of people who keep kosher in a really strict way. Some people have the practice of, if they see a blood spot in an egg, they um, they just take out the blood spot. You know, like they use actually the same way that you would maybe take the eggshell itself and fish out the, uh, the piece of shell that fell in there. You would fish out the little blood spot and you're fine. Some people are more strict. They would throw out the whole egg 
or they would feed it to their pets or they would feed it to um, they would give it to a non Jew is another um, another idea. Um, I'm looking at the chat. Um, we have a few more minutes and um, thank you for everyone who's bringing some other um, some other angles. Um, I love this comment. Maybe the soul is generated out of the same body process. Maybe the soul is generated out of the same body process that generates the soul. I, I wonder if they meant um, when generates the soul, if you meant blood. Uh, maybe the blood is generated out of the same process that generates the, the, the soul. I like that, um, where you're going with that. Um, another comment, one of the reasons why the blood in the egg is prohibited is it's actually, uh, it's a fertilized egg. So it's like you're eating like it's a future chicken, and that's also problematic because you're eating this like tiny um, baby chicken. Um, uh, some people are saying, "Oh yeah, I, I check eggs for blood. I have that. Um, I have that practice." Um, and yeah, we have a few comments. Is this blood spot the beginning of life? And so it's it, blood is blood. So if it's red or sometimes it's like a light brown, that it's blood and that we shouldn't eat it. Um, like a lot of kashrut rules, if you if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. So there's like lehat khila before the fact and medievad after the fact. So if you make like a hard boiled egg and you didn't check your egg before you made a hard boiled egg, because who does that? Um, and you never see the blood spot, it's as if it was never there. Um, so there's a there's some like loopholes um, in that way. Um, okay, well, what I what I really want us to um, to take from this, and thank you everyone who made it to the end. Um, <laughs> what I really want us to take from this is um, keep keep asking these questions. So we 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 barely we barely talked about the question of. How do I feel about eating an animal that used to be alive? Or how do I feel about eating the flesh of an animal? We're just talking about the blood. But whether you keep kosher or you slaughter your own animals or you buy an animal that you know the person who slaughtered it or you watch someone else slaughter it, I think looking at this very, very, very ancient practice and how it's still practiced today, people still care about it. Um, I am. Um, I thought that I put this in the sheet, but um, for some reason it didn't come out. So I'm going to share it. I'm going to add it to the sheet as soon as we finish, and I'll also put it in the chat. Um, but there's an idea that um, here. Let's see. I'll put it in the chat. Let's see. There's an idea about um, candling eggs, looking for blood. Yes. Um, someone mentioned Rav Cook before. Um, Oh, transfer of files is restricted by your account admin. Um, oops, okay, I'm just going to share it and I'll add it to the sheet in just a minute. Um, um, there's an idea, I want to I close with this passage from Rav Cook. And this is another layer of the practice of kosher slaughter. And um, it is so common um, that, um, and we read about it very briefly in Levit Leviticus 17. Um, this is his commentary in Leviticus 17. It is, it, this is about covering the blood with soil. And it is such an essential part of the kashrut process of, of the animal slaughter, kosher animal slaughter process, that even in a huge slaughterhouse with assembly lines, they bring a bottle of they bring a bucket of soil to cover the blood after each slaughter. So it's both that we're draining out the blood and then the blood that has been drained out doesn't just, I don't know, go in a bucket and go in the trash and go away. But this ritual of covering the blood with soil and I, I, I want to see how this lands with people. I'm going to read this and it's going to be our last text. Can everyone, can everyone see this text? Great. Covering the blood of beast and fowl is a kind of divine protest against the permission to eat meat, which is fundamentally conditional upon the corrupt state of the human soul, going back to Genesis, where it says, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from its youth. This is the soul which says, I will eat meat because of the craving to eat meat, 
and even eats meat as much as it pleases without any concept of inner opposition owing to an awareness of what is good and just. The Torah, however, declares, cover the blood. So again, this is the blood that we've drained out from the animal. Hide your shame and your moral weakness, even though humanity has not yet reached the level which it is capable of reaching, nor given this elevated morality any real influence in practical living. So thank you, Rav Cook, for that reflection. Some of you know that he, he was a vegetarian. Uh, uh, I think he ate fish on Shabbat, something like that. Um, and I'll leave you with that to, uh, to chew on and wishing you a Shabbat Shalom and I'll pass it to Mara to say goodbye. Thank you all so much. We will include the source sheet and uh, the other resources that um, Kohana Shmira uh, shared with us. And um, we're hoping whatever you decide to consume this Shabbat, um, it is a meaningful one, a restful one. And uh, we hope to see you here next week. Uh, Thank Shabbat. you, Mark. Reload the, the, the source sheet. The Rav Cook is at the bottom. Great. Shabbat shalom, everyone.